I'm just setting my recordings going. Welcome. Um, and I hope you've had a lovely day. <laughs> um, <clears throat> let's just start by inviting the Holy Spirit in. Um, it's very good to get to remember to invite the Holy Spirit in wherever you are consciously until he becomes the whole spirit that you live in, <laughs> in your holiness, the Holy Spirit. So where our minds join with the Holy Spirit in this love and light and blessing. So let's just get quiet and consciously ask. Holy Spirit, you be in charge. You decide for God, for me. Bless me. Bless my mind with your wisdom and love and truth. You be the mind which, which I think. You be the mind with which I love. And if I step outside of this love, please correct my thinking as soon as possible. Amen. <coughs> okay. On my journey, uh, I really uh, consciously had to invite the Holy Spirit in more and more. And Rules for Decision, Chapter 30, um, I'm not going to go through that today, but uh, I've done some videos on uh, how to understand Rules for Decision on my YouTube channel, but that's a fantastic process that Jesus gives us. It's pretty much, there's lots of prayers uh, and we've got our workbook, but um, this is the, well, what I can see in the first real process of um, how to <laughs> how to live, uh, he says. Imagine a happy day, visualize it, and this will the day you'll be given. So basically, um, the the way is to sit down and visualize everything you'd like to happen for your day. And I think what he's pointing to is just this love. So we just visualise ourselves loving, people loving us, smiling. Um, <clears throat> the joy, joyful, peaceful, loving. So however that comes into our minds, it's more of a, a feeling. He says, imagine what's going to happen to you. You can have everyone you meet. Um, I generally do that everyone I meet is going to smile at me, I'm going to smile back. And this is um, the reason why it's so important for us to visualise this is because what the teaching is, is that everything is projected from my mind. I'm seeing my thoughts projected out. And so when I visualise, um, when my thoughts are loving and I visualise a loving world, it will be what I see. And he says, this is the day you will have if you make no decisions on your own. And on your own means with the ego because the ego is the default. So uh, so we choose the Holy Spirit. Anyway, That's a, it's a beautiful teaching. And it can, if you want to go through that, do it for 30 days and see how your world can transpire. It's a beautiful, lovely uh, way. Do it for the rest of your life. I do. <laughs> Initially, I did it for 30 days and I just, uh, I just naturally wake up and say, okay, this day is just going to be blessed and gorgeous and love. And um, <clears throat> so for some reason, I'm really feeling like prompted to talk about the absolute, which some non-dual teachers call the absolute. Um, and 
the best description I've seen, it's only a very short description, is Gary Renard's Disappearance of the Universe. There's probably lots of descriptions around, but I'm not widely read. Um, I listen to a few teachers, but generally I've um, just stuck to the course and the course-related material. But... Uh, so Disappearance of the Universe, I, I did do a video on um, the stages of non-duality, but what the pure non-duality is that um, there's only the mind of God and it is definitely that we can get back there and believe it or not, we already are awake. You've got that awakened mind already and we've just got the blocks so we've got some blocks in our minds and really this dedication to undoing the blocks. So it's really like um, the sun is shining and the clouds are the blocks and we just need to wipe those blocks away or see them as false. And then the sun just shines. Now, I guess um, it sounds easy when I'm just talking about it, but those blocks for me were very difficult at the time to undo. When we're in our egoic mind, it's not, well, for me, and I'm only talking for me, it wasn't easy to do, but it is doable. And it is takes great willingness to watch your mind and to question. Now, uh, I'm going to today, my talk is um, called What is an Idol? And it's from Chapter 29, uh, uh, sorry, yeah, Chapter 29, Section 9. And it's from the uh, Circle of Atonement book. So I'm not sure if any of the wording is going to be different to the FIP version. I've just started using this new Circle of Atonement version because my other course book is falling apart and I <laughs> and I don't want to ruin it anymore it's just getting really battered and um, <clears throat> so um, I thought I might first of all just talking about the absolute is that this is the absolute this is the mind of God and there's nothing outside of it so the mind of God <clears throat> sees everything as God it's it's oneness, it's one with everything. Um, and it is, uh, there's nothing outside of it. And there's, there's just pure, it's a, it's a mind. So what we come to see is to start off with, we come to see that we're an ego mind. So we come to see that our thoughts so it's a very gradual transition from coming from a person or an ego or persona. Person means persona, which is mask. And it means so our thoughts are creating a self-concept or a person. So we have lots of beliefs and those beliefs create an identity and those beliefs are also centred around the idea that I am this body and that I'm limited and the mind is in the body. So we, we're on a journey of no distance. And the reason why it's no distance is when you actually have the awakening, you realise uh, the timelessness, you actually. But the ego's mind is on a timeline and the Holy Spirit is coming into the timeline to undo and correct our thinking. And this thinking, as he says in the course, uh, you can only be upset by your thoughts. So if those thoughts feel like a voice, but it's just thoughts and you can slow down and be, become aware of your thoughts, and then once you're aware of your thoughts, we can question them. Now, we have to have the willingness to question all our thoughts and our beliefs. And this is the rub because we can so easily get, be on a spiritual path and get upset and justify it. 
and it's very easy to be hoodwinked and don't worry oh, <laughs> it's it's the nature of the ego to subtly bring in a judgment or an upset um, the the it takes so much willingness to sit down and say i'm going to question all my thoughts i'm going to question uh, why am I upset about this particular thing? And I'm going to look at it and become more aware of what my thoughts are telling me. Now, um, a lot of traditions, they say, just let your thoughts go. Uh, I've never found that helpful because I found that they just keep coming and um, then I'm just constantly letting them go. And um, the course is a bit different. It says that you need to uh, bring up the unconscious thoughts and give them to the Holy Spirit. So it's like then they get undone and they stop. So I really like the analogy of the um, bubble machine in a fishing in a fish tank, and that's producing the thoughts and the bubbles. When they hit the top of the water, they break open, and that's the thoughts. So the thoughts are entering the mind. But what's coming, the bubble machine below it, is the beliefs or the desires. And these need to be seen through. They need to be brought up into awareness. And it's not to bring them up and worry about them. Um, it's to look at them and to see the falseness of it. And this takes tremendous willingness because um, it is so easy to judge uh, it's so easy to believe that uh, say for example cigarette smoke affects me um, or um, uh, you know somebody doing something affects me this is we, we cannot let one little thought be escape us. We have to say, is that true? Can who I am be affected by cigarette smoke? This is, um, this is just one tiny thing that I'm pointing to, but this is the willingness that we need to say. We need to be able to question everything and it's very easy for the ego to say uh, no I'm really affected uh, by cigarette smoke I know a few people that have spoken to me have believe have a belief that cigarette smoke can affect them and it's hurting them and it's um, and this is what happens is um, first of all we have to see we have to we have to be willing to question it. Otherwise, we, we're actually keeping a self-concept in place. A self, a small self, a small separated self cannot exist without these beliefs. And this is the, this is the rub. This is the intensity that you have to be. You have to want this peace of God above wanting to be right about cigarette smoke and to give up all these beliefs of what can actually affect us. Jesus says in Lesson 76, there's no laws but God's and he goes on to talk about um, these things about nutrition and friendships and you know, um, just things that we think can affect us. And he's telling us constantly we're not a body. And he's not asking us to uh, go from believing we're a body to actually experiencing or understanding or realising we're not a body. He's not asking us to do that really quickly. He's just asking us to bring everything to the Holy Spirit and to be willing to question it. And so, you know... He's telling us that food has no effects at all on the body. And, you know, people just get, can't believe that, that actually food 
there's nothing in food. It's only the belief of what food, of what's in food. And that's why if you look around, uh, everybody gets affected differently by food because there's different beliefs and they're so hidden, they're so deep. And we have to not worry about what anyone else has got as a belief around food. We have to look at our beliefs, what the ego is telling us about food. And Jesus is telling us that food has no qualities at all. There's no particular mineral, there's no protein. I've had to, I've transformed all those beliefs. Um, you know, my mum says, you know, you're getting enough protein. And I just say, I don't believe in protein. It's actual food does nothing. It absolutely does nothing to the body. Everything comes from the mind. The health of the body is a complete statement of your state of mind. He says it over and over again. And this is um, what we need to question. We need to question everything. And what, I'm, what I've very clearly realised when I awakened or this mind awake, awoke uh, to the truth is that I can't give this to anyone else. I can only uh, really, the only thing I can ever say is that I was very, very, very willing to question. And if you do, you will awaken because without beliefs there's nothing that's whole these are the blocks now you've got to realize that these are the blocks that are blocking your you from the awareness that you've already got you've already got this awareness of oneness you've already got this gorgeous mind of love and um and it's just your willingness, you know, and I, I've worked with people and they're so willing and they just question everything and they just get this amazing insight. And then there's others that are just, it's, they're just on the same, but they're, they just don't have the willingness. And the reason is, is because of the fear. And it's like the ego does not want you to wake up. It fights you. And it's really funny because it's a, just a false thought system. It's like a virus in a computer fighting the truth. So you've got the whole operating system of the computer that's clear. And the virus gets in and then the virus can, tries to convince the actual operating system that it's real and it, and it doesn't need to question the virus. And that's why it takes a lot of willingness and that's why we need the Holy Spirit. We need to quieten our mind and we need to please help me see this differently when we're upset. And sometimes we're, uh, when we are asking to awaken, the ego ramps up and it goes from suspicious to vicious. And it can seem at that time when you're on your journey that you, you're touching uh, a lot of fear. And this spiritual journey is not cushy. <laughs> um, and this is where uh, we need to develop a lot of trust. We need to develop that we be held. And when we talk about the no me, emptiness the void um, the mind of god um, there's no one here um, it can sound like there's um like it's empty but it's so beautiful and so peaceful and so loving to live in god's mind and it's the holiness and it sees the holiness everywhere and so we need to work on our mind where we're holding someone or something as not holy. We're not seeing the holiness. That's what we need to do. We have to practice. It's a practicing until our mind's illuminated. So it's a journey, it's a mind training. And only only you can do it. 
no uh, no teacher can do it for you. You can listen to Course in Miracles teachers, you can read the Course in Miracles book, you can do the workbook, you can be as knowledgeable as you like and you can speak with authority about the course principles. But unless you are ready to get quiet and go within your own mind and look at all your grievances and all your judgments and all your beliefs, every single one has to go. You have to see your attachments and you have to let them go. It doesn't mean that they won't be there. You cannot be attached to anything because, and it feels like everything that the ego holds up in this world, it feels like you've put your safety there and that's what we'll be going through today. What is an idol? These are idols in this world and they're keeping us asleep in a dream of separation. And they're keeping us constantly in a state of fear. Um, so the only thing that a teacher can do really for you is um, really when I was listening to teachers on my journey of undoing, all they were really, there were some very helpful ways they were explaining certain concepts and principles of the course, which were very helpful. But really the only other thing they were doing was saying, I, I undid these beliefs and I am peaceful, my mind. I'm, that's all they were saying is my mind is peaceful. I've got a happy mind and... If you do this, if you're willing, you will too. And really that's any, that's all awakened people are saying. They can give you pointers. But you really have to have this willingness. And I know there's, I've heard this concept, this Buddhist concept of, you know, if someone's got holding your head in a bucket of water, holding you down, how much would you fight to get your breath? I don't think it's particularly that type of, um, you know, that feels like a sort of a struggling to get your breath. But what I feel has to come, has to be a commitment, has to be wholehearted. And really that's where it comes from, this wholehearted, you know, I'm in, I'm all in and I'm going to uh, just, just do what needs to be done. And another part of it, this journey is to realise that you're going to sometimes fall back and you're going to fall into fear. And, but it's really, sometimes it's two step forward and one step back. But as he says, you can't judge your advances from your retreats. But when it does feel like that, just know that you've gone two steps forward. You are forward every time you look at something in your mind every time you question a belief. And you really have to be serious about this. You have to practice this. You have to practice the, the lessons. And really, um, it's just saying that, uh, um, I mean, it, it seems to take time, but it, with the willingness, it can be quite a quick time for all those beliefs to go and sometimes you'll undo a belief and a whole lot unravel all in one go and you know on my journey I just ended up I would start to think I'd meet someone that I hadn't met for a while that I'd had a judgment or a grievance with and I'd worked a lot on someone else that I had a grievance with and when I met them again there was nothing in my mind I, there was no judgment so it works, he says it just works across so many aspects. So we're, we're really just seeing the past projected into our minds. We're just seeing the past. And um, it's sort of, a, as I said, it's a holographic teaching. So it's very beautiful how he brings in who we are, that we are this beautiful, we were created as we are as God created us. Now we're spirit, but spirit is, it's not, it's, it's without form. 
So the absolute has no form. Um, we, we seem to be here in the end. We're still um, having an experience, but there's no one having it. There's not a referencing to a self that has the experience. There's just experiencing. So there's just this beautiful, loving experiencing by no one. And that's what we end up with. We end up with a life as it is. And the mind is just completely in the present moment, loving what is. It's completely in love with what is. And it's delighted with every little thing that happens. And that's what we see. It's now. It's right now. This is, it escapes us when we think that um, it's something in time in the future. Uh, if you look at a flower or you look at anything, it's right now, right here, right now, as it is. And that's as simple. It's simply seeing what is without any meaning. So the meaning goes away and then what presents itself is just God or holiness of everything. So this is what we're looking for. When we remove the blocks, we have true vision. And, the, and what we've done is nothing's changed outside us. The projection or the, what we're seeing is not seen with eyes so much. It's seen with the spiritual mind, the mind of God. So we're seeing, we're seeing it differently. And that's what we're asking for, help you see this differently. And in the end, everything is seen differently. It's seen with, with love. We're, we're just seeing the world from our mind. The world is the projection of our mind. So rather than fear, we're seeing a love, a love, a world of love. And we're seeing our brother as ourselves. And these are not just concepts. These are something that is deeply experienced. <clears throat> That's why he says, don't delay, go for the experience. But it's just really important. I just always like to talk about how important it is to be committed and how important it is to be willing to look at, to undo your beliefs. Those beliefs hold a separate self together in our minds. And to me, that's the way to undo, is to do the lessons and question all the grievances, to really go deeply, undo. I know Regina has, I haven't looked at her, um, I've heard someone talk about she's got a, a, um, a process called going to the core beliefs or core upsets or something about core, and that's what we need to get to. Diedrich Walsack has... Um, the Six Steps for Freedom through his um, website called Choose Again. That's the process I use with people. It's so important uh, to undo. Root cause inquiry is Regina. So if you want to really, you're committed in, um, it's on her website. Um, are you able to give me the name of the website so I can just... Uh, mention it. Um, I'm not sure whether it's on Awakening Together or Regina's website. Um, but we need to dedicate ourselves to looking at our minds. To, we have to catch these thoughts. And we have to undo them. And as we do, we really do get um, this freedom. And then through that, uh, the mind has to awaken it's um, and you know you can use Byron Katie's process as well. Um, I use I use her process, but I think initially it has to go deeper. It has to go back to the feelings, um, and I I quite like the the six steps for freedom, and um, and I haven't looked at Regina's root cause inquiry, but I have a feeling it's possibly in a similar vein and some people that I've spoken to have said that it's really really helpful so get on to that we really need to um, undo these blocks and it is possible so what is an idol 
and this is from The Course in Miracles, uh, Chapter 29, Section 9. What is an idol? Do you think you know? For idols are unrecognised as such and never seen for what they really are. That is the only power that they have. Their purpose is obscure and they are feared and worshipped both because you do not know what they are for and why they have been made. <clears throat> so what happens is in our egoic mind, the ego mind has so many idols. It's, and a lot of them are very subtle. Now, as you undo the bigger ones, you'll get down to a level of very subtle idols. And the more you undo, the more you need to be really, really, really vigilant for the most subtlest of our idols that the ego brings up. So the ego is not you, it's just a thought system. And it's basically telling you of what of where your safety lies. And it's and it all is always around a body. So the ego is a thought system that says, I am a body. And then when that's believed, we feel our body and we think, yes, I am in this body. But as we undo, we realise I am not a body. I'm not, I, I'm not going to deny this body, but I am not a body. And we start to really feel into that spirit, that all that is. Um, and the idols, <clears throat> they're never seen for what they really are. Now, what they really are is to keep you asleep because while you, your mind is attaching to something in this world as an idol. Now, an idol is just um, something that you think will bring you happiness and it's always generally in the future. It's perceived as if I have this, I will be happy. And that's the thought that comes in that needs to be questioned. You see, all these thoughts need to be questioned, inquired, because they are related to a self. This is when I have this, who is this I that has to have it? Uh, their purpose is to obscure. So their purpose is to obscure who you are, who you are. While you have idols, while you believe in idols, while you believe the thoughts that tell you there is something here in this world that can make you happy. Say, for example, you're living with someone that doesn't make you happy. You're, you're upset with them and you want to move out and you believe that uh, I'm going to go somewhere and I'm going to be with better people. I'm going to, my happiness lies in uh, getting a nice place, living with a nice person. <laughs> These are all idols. These are all idols. I'm going to get a better job. I'm hopefully going to have nicer, a nicer manager. These are all the ways we're kept asleep. These are idols. It's always in the future and it's always the promise of some happiness. And what it is, is the egos, it comes back to this root belief that I am a body. And it comes, these idols... Uh, when something is different, I will be happy. And that's the way the ego keeps us asleep. And they obscure it. They, they, they obscure these idols, obscure the light within us because they keep us on, it's like a donkey with a carrot in front of it. They keep you chasing an elusive happiness. And in that chasing, we don't question the actual belief of what 
is going to make us happy. So in that chasing it, so we're just on this treadmill. And even when you're on a spiritual path and you're doing this work, you really have to question this. And this is the hard part because we have to really question, is this going to make me happy? Um, and we have to just do investigate, investigate, investigate. And, you know, is another job going to make me happy? Um, what is the ego putting out in front of me as my happiness? Because what's right here, right now, isn't this good enough? <laughs> Right here, right now, where you are now. If you've got clothes, you've got food, you're sitting down, doing whatever you're doing. That's it. That's as simple as that. God's right here. God's just showing himself. It's beautiful. There's nothing better than this. And this is it. The while we're in a dream that there's going to be some happiness in the future, we're rejecting now. Now's not good enough. We overlook now and we're waiting for the future. But actually what is revealed is there's never not now. You can't be out of the now. Try to get out of the now and we come to see that we're always in the now and there's no past or future. It looks like a timeline. It really does look like we're going from past, there's a moment in time and then there's a future. But it's not. That's the actual complete bullshit illusion <laughs> yeah nobody's ever experienced the future as they'll say <laughs> okay so the root cause inquiry is at reginadawnacres.com forward slash another hyphen dozen hyphen classics anyway i'm sure if you just google regina dawn acres root cause inquiry, you'll get that coming up. So um, so the, the, the truth is that, um, yeah, you, can't, you cannot get into the future and you cannot get into the past only through thinking about it. And even when you're thinking about them, you're in the now thinking about the past and you're in the now thinking about the future. Thinking about something, that's all you're doing is you're actually in the present, the eternal always, thinking about something. So you're actually asleep, thinking about something that's not here and you're missing. You're missing the now. You're missing life. You're missing living life. Life is here. <laughs> Sorry, love it. Just... Oh, the other day I was on a Zoom group and I started laughing with someone and we just laughed for about five minutes. And um, it's really joyful when you when you just it's it's just so free. It really is this freedom when you and you don't have beliefs. And I was listening to someone yesterday on and um, they were talking about how our greatest fears are death. And free falling, like falling. I've never had a fear of falling off a cliff and um, and just free falling and nothing to hold us. But really, that's what that's what um, being awake is. It's really just being free. You're free falling in every moment, but you don't hit anything ever. So you're just going through life. There's no planning as such. And um, and then death. Well, you're not scared of death. Because part of the waking up is confronting death and actually coming to see that you, if you're, the realisation in waking up is that you're not a body. You realise that. It's realised. It's a self-realisation that you're not a body. And therefore, you can't die. So therefore, there's living. And therefore, it's only ever this moment. And this moment is the most beautiful. This is where God is. God's in this moment. And he always is here. It's an eternal moment that never leaves. And it's timeless. And it's all in the mind. So he says to us that we're only in the mind. 
Um, so an idol is an image of your brother which you would value more than what he is. So we put an image of our brother. So we might, um, as a female, we might say, um, oh, you know, that man's better looking than that other man and there's judgment and there's all this judgment around bodies. So it's like someone somewhere created a, um, an idea about what is good looking and what is not good looking. And then um, we've all believed that. So we, we watch the media in some ways and we've got get an idea. And it's, um, it's really, that's why you've even got a question, you know, <laughs> got a question about what's, what is attractive. It doesn't mean that you won't ever have a relationship and find someone that's attractive. But what happens is it goes beyond that. We look beyond the bodies. So where an idol is um, when we see we're, we're making up an image which you would value more than what he is. So what he is is this, well, I would just call this Christ innocent self. And that's something that is seen with the spiritual eye. It's like something that you know. It's like a knowing in your mind of who he is. and we don't put the idol as the body. Um, idols are made that he may be replaced no matter what their form. Idols are made that he may be replaced no matter what the form. So in other words, um, what everything is God and when we make an idol, we're selecting one piece of this dream to be an idol, whereas we can't, know that everything is God while we're selecting an idol out. And his, and that um, he, he says, my idols are made that he, he, in terms of he is the truth, the innocence. So we're replacing him with the form. Now, it can be a car, it can be a job, it can be whatever you place where you think your happiness is. Now, this even applies to being well. If you're sick, you have make an idol of being well. Um, if you're poor, you make an idol of being rich. Everything, these are very, very subtle. If you have to see that these are idols. And it's very hard because the ego says to you, if you let go of an idol of being well, you'll always be sick and you'll suffer. So if you don't have this idol of seeing a healthy body and being a healthy body, um, so it's constantly got you resisting sickness and it's got your mind caught in a loop and we have to go beyond that. If you're sick, you cannot have an idol of being well. You have to see that um, what might be felt as sickness is usually grievances held in your mind. So go there, let the body, just allow the body to do what the body's doing. It will do what it's doing and just take whatever medications at that particular time that you need. But uh, don't make an idol out of wellness because the, that's where uh, you can get uh, stuck. And so make your dedication to undoing the grievances and the judgments. And when they're undone, the body will just get well. It will just be well. Now, I'm not saying that it'll never get anything ever again, um, but a lot of that suffering will go, especially the suffering of, you know, things like migraines and um, stomach ulcers and um, things like that. They will be, they will, generally leave as you you but see this is such a it's so subtle because it's so easy when you're in a lot of pain to to want to be well and um whenever i'm working with anyone that has a lot of sickness or seems to be suffering in um it's really important that what I share with them is that to welcome, to be really totally okay. I look forward to being sick. Um, 
wake up in the morning and welcome the pain. And what it does is it turns it around in our minds because every time we're resisting it, um, it's like the resistance is the issue. And so um, as we just look, I look forward to this and then, you know, what do I need to do? Um, and it's like if you were 60 and you, um, you had another 20 years left in this, is, as this dream character and you were sick, um, you could spend 20 years every day resisting and being angry that your body is unwell and you can be angry, you can be lying there thinking this should be different, I should be walking outside, I should be spending time with others, you know, um, why can't I be well? I'm, up, I'm very upset that I'm sick so we're making an idol of wellness. We can't resist something we do not think is real. That's what Hal's written here. Um, <clears throat> yes, exactly. So we, yeah, that's it. <laughs> I hadn't thought of it that way, Hal. So we do, yes, we resist. So if we believe in sickness, and the thing is that the mind does, the ego does believe in sickness because, first of all, its premise is on the body. That's always the premise that sits at the bottom, I am a body. And that's why Jesus comes to the root cause. You basically say he's going right down <laughs> the root cause, I am not a body. Now, if that is realised, all that other stuff takes care of itself. It all just takes care of itself because how can you be sick if you're not a body? A well body and a sick body are the same thing. If you're not a body, what's... <laughs> Just let it do what it wants to do. So um, let's get back to the idols. And as I said, sickness, uh, wellness is an idol. And these are really interesting things that we that that, are, that the ego makes as idols. And and it is this which never is perceived and recognised. So you 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 can't even see. So the so the mind has a grievance. Um, the body. It's resonated into the body as sickness. Um, then the ego says, I shouldn't be sick, I should be well. And then it resists sickness and it makes idol of wellness and we're stuck, we're just stuck in this loop. And um, I know because I had chronic fatigue and depression. Uh, I had depression most of my life. Well, the ego is depression, so it's like not me had depression. I had uh, believed my thoughts which were causing um, my mind to suffer and then chronic fatigue came in and chronic fatigue and I mean he says judgment causes you to be tired of course I was judging <laughs> all the time my mind was just fully in and so of course tiredness and depression and chronic fatigue they all go together um, it is this which never is perceived and recognized but it be, sorry be it a body or a thing a place a situation or a circumstance, an object owned or wanted, or a right demanded or achieved, it is the same. Now, I want to go back through that sentence again because this, he's telling us what the idols are. Very, very clearly, these are the idols of the ego that we have to see through. Okay, be it a body. So the idol can be the body. So uh, once we glorify this body and say, there you go, I'm saying, I'm just going to say we say, but it, remember it is actually the ego thought system that we're believing that is saying it. It's not us saying it because who we are is not our thoughts. We are the witness of the thoughts. But while we're asleep, this is where he's, 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 uh, this teaching is to the mind that's believing its thoughts and he's trying to get us back from that. So he's bringing in, so be it a body. So when we think we are this body, um, we glorify it and we make it, uh, we have to, so we compare ourselves with other bodies. And really this, this, particular idol of being a body 
it's very, 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 uh, it's a lot of suffering when there's an identification as who I am as a body because what happens is it's constantly comparing and it never, ever, ever can get it right because the minute um, something is done, um, some, some change is made, some new makeup or some new clothes or whatever, the next thought is, oh, no, that's not it. There's a new shirt to be worn. There's new shoes. There's a new tattoo. There's a new hairstyle. Um, you know, there's a new plastic surgery procedure. Um, there's something. It's always something. There's a new shape of the eyebrow. Um, it's a constant, if you have a look at how, the glorification of the body keeps you asleep and it will it's painful because the minute you 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 know you might spend a lot of money getting something for your body and then within a certain amount of time there'll be a thought about how that's not it and it's it's just terribly suffering uh so be it a body or a thing a thing <laughs> as a thing so a thing anything any single thing a cup you know it's like oh I've, I've got my coffee cup here it's a very plain one today it's like no this thing is not good enough now I need to have the thing that's got the special flower on it so therefore I spend many hours researching the shop that sells the one with the special flower motif on it and this thing is not good enough because if my neighbours come for dinner and they see this, this thing, I'll be judged. So, therefore, I have to get rid of this thing very quickly and get the other thing. And, therefore, I will be judged as really important because I have this thing that's got this special thing on it and then I go and get it and I buy it and then I've spent the thing called money on it and then I worry because I've spent a lot of money on that thing to get it. And then my neighbours don't come for dinner. And then that thing sits in the cupboard. And then I worry about how I'm going to pay the thing called money back to the credit card people. <laughs> and then a year later, that thing's out of fashion. And actually what's back in fashion now is this thing. So I get rid of the other thing with the flower motive on it. And I get this thing back. I go hunting for it. It might take me two years to find this thing, but it's very important that I have this thing back because it's now retro and retro's in. So I've got to get this thing back. So these are all the things that we idolise and keep us asleep. And it sounds funny. <laughs> and it is funny. Okay, so I think a place. So we can idolise a place. A holiday, maybe it's a... Uh, the egos, or we, we think. Um, oh, it's getting. I'm getting on to time. <laughs> a place, okay. A place is a house, um, a holiday, somewhere else than this. The idol is the place. If I get to that place, I'll be happy. And when that place comes about, uh, a situation. Oh, when my situation changes, I'll be happy. Or a circumstance. When my, circum when my financial situation changes, I'll be happy. Or an object owned or wanted. Yeah, we talked about the cup. That's an object owned or wanted. It's an idol. Or a right demanded. Now, this is another idol. Uh, when I demand my rights, yes, uh, mm, what are my rights? <laughs> Any right. I've got a right to be um, a gay I want to, I've got my gay rights. Now, there's nothing wrong with gay rights, uh, but they are idols. They're idols because we're all God and we're all one. So when I stand for my gay rights, I've made an idol out of something. And when I've got my heterosexual rights, when I'm demanding those, <laughs> I've got an idol. And they're all to keep us asleep in idols, thinking things. Where are we? Or... Uh, it is the same. So they're all the same. So interestingly, oh, my God, <laughs> I got through one paragraph. 
<laughs> I don't really get very far. But anyway, it's gorgeous. It look, it's fine. I love it. <laughs> yeah, Hal knows. Uh, he said he knows that I never. He hears my talk each week. <laughs> so I don't really get very far. I intended to get through that whole page, but anyway. So blessings, and um, I love you. I honour you. And I bless you and have a lovely day and just keep working on those beliefs. Keep seeing them as false. They're not who we are. We're not this body. We are the love of God and we are this happiness and we're all this happiness and God is this love and so are we. And bless you and have a beautiful week. Thank you. Thanks, Hal. Thanks, everyone. Okay.